I mean, it, the science of it is, the execution of it, it's almost impossible to be exact. Welcome back to Ask the Energy Advisor. I'm your Energy Advisor, Brian Hawk at Noble REMC. Uh, as you may or may not be able to tell, we are in a crawl space. Um, this is going to continue on to our previous video of uh, air sealing insulating a crawl space door. So what we're going to talk about today is crawl space encapsulation. And the long and short of that means we're essentially going to take this unconditioned crawl space and turn it into a semi-conditioned uh, short basement. As you can see around me, we've already, already got a start on this. Um, <clears throat> One thing that you need to remember or be cautious of right out of the gate, again, we're in a confined space, so we've got our <clears throat> gas monitor going on at all times to make sure that we're protected. Um, and anytime you look at encapsulating a crawl space, that means you're, you're conditioning the entire space. So this particular crawl space, we are underneath a modular home, so it has a vapor barrier above me with insulation above that. And what's happened over time is we had a, a contractor come in and install some new ductwork down here in the crawl space, and it's unconditioned. And that means essentially this ductwork is not insulated, so any heat that we're pushing down into that ductwork in the wintertime is being absorbed down here in this cold crawl space. This cold crawl space is cold because this concrete is uninsulated, and if you can see behind me, uh, we have an event right here, which is really typical in Indiana crawl spaces. This particular crawl space has four of them. <clears throat> so in the wintertime, this crawl space is actually moving cold air through it. They're, they're, they're not real heavy built, so even though the vents are shut, uh, it is not truly shut. You're, you're drawing cool air in all the time. So another thing we need to consider before we try and encapsulate a crawl space is this needs to be a continuous barrier. And it's, it's a little bit difficult to see right now, but we have a vapor barrier that was already installed in this crawl space. I've been through this crawl space and it is continuous through the entire crawl space. It has a real nice three or four inch layer of pea gravel over top of it. So with that being said, um, that will continue to keep our moisture down in the ground, not allow it up into this space, which is why these vents were brought into to place in the first place. In the summertime, in the warm, humid months, you know, a crawl space can actually get a lot of moisture in it. If you do not have properly drained downspouts, you can bring a lot of water, actually groundwater down into this crawl space. Again, knowing that we have a vapor barrier in place, I've been out here and inspected this crawl space after three days of continuous rain. We just had another 12 hours of rain yesterday. Uh, humidity levels are great down here. No moisture, uh, very little moisture. There's always a little bit of moisture, but very little moisture in this crawl space at all. So we're going to <clears throat> close these vents off knowing full well that we've taken every precaution to make sure this crawl space dry, is, stays dry. Um, and with that, we'll talk about the tools we're going to need for this video. Um, same basic tools that we've been using. You know, I've always got my drill with me. Um, this time we're going we're gonna to upsize a little bit. This is my hammer drill. What we're going to be doing is we're going to use our same walnut sized globs of glue on the back side of this insulation we're going <clears> to <throat> adhere that to the concrete i'm going to hammer drill and fasten this uh, insulation board to the wall with masonry fasteners you know, more commonly known as tapcons tapcons are a, a trademark brand but most people will know these as a tapcon got a washer on the end of that tapcon to make sure that when we draw that in we're being very careful not to blow through the paper on this on this insulation that's going to help hold it there um, realistically, these tap cons are here for one thing, and that's to hold this insulation until that glue dries. So we don't need to have these every 8 or 16 inches. This is going to be literally just to hold this insulation here until the glue dries. Um, <clears throat> along that, one of the things we always need to be considered of, even though we don't have any carbon monoxide down here, we're in a dry crawl space, so you're going to be kicking up all kinds of dust and debris. Depending on the age of the crawl space, you know, that can be pretty... Um, it may or may not be harmful to your system, but it's going to put your system into shock. It gets in your nasal passages, down in your lungs. You're going to be hacking and gagging for a while when you're done. So uh, this is kind of extreme. <clears throat> this is my 3M uh, mask that I use when I'm around spray foam or when I'm doing any painting or staining. Um, I've got some N95 masks here that are more for dust and contaminants. Um, 
earplugs. <clears throat> when we're gonna be running that hammer drill, that's gonna be quite loud down here, so earplugs are gonna be a must. Safety glasses, always a must anytime you're doing any kind of drilling. Um, gloves, now the gloves are here for two reasons. If you don't like digging around in the dirt, you know, put a pair of gloves on. This particular insulation is polyisocyanurate, and this has a fiber mesh paper on the back side of it. Uh, that fiber mesh is <clears throat> reason I'm wearing a long sleeve, and another reason to wear these masks is that fiber mesh is more of a fiberglass, and it's a lot like handling pink fiberglass insulation. It'll it'll make you itch, and it'll um, cause some more irritation in other parts of your body that you really don't want to be irritated. So um, I believe that covers every one of our. <clears throat> safety issues um, so again we're gonna have our caulk gun here with our foam approved glue um, we're gonna introduce this guy today this is our canister uh, great stuff that's another brand name you're not really not stuck on a brand name there are all kinds of different cans of foam or brands of foam <clears throat> this is a foam gun the beauty of having this foam gun is this can becomes a 30-day use can instead of a one-and-done throw it away so this gun will actually keep all of this foam back in this in this gun in this tip portion and it will not set up in there for up to 30 days and we've also got a can of cleaner over there that once you're done with this as soon as you're done if we know we're done with the project we screw a can of cleaner on here cycle the trigger a few times it cleans this gun out and it's also got a little spray nozzle on it so that you can clean anything that's on this tip away from it great tool to add to your kit i mean this can be used for all the videos we're going to talk about, we could probably put it, put this in just about every one of them in one one form or another. So, about a thirty dollar gun. These are twelve or thirteen bucks a can, so a little bit more expensive than a one and done can, but you get a lot more life out of them and actually a lot more product. <clears throat> As you can see behind me, uh, really the only exact science that that we've talked about or we're going to talk about in this particular video is the actual encapsulation itself we've always got to be concerned about water we've always got to be concerned about vapor and moisture so we've already addressed that <clears throat> rigid foam spray foam this particular foam actually came out of this can as you can see we've we've already done a couple pieces it was not an exact fit the beauty of of working with weatherization or working with this foam is as you can see anything that's not an exact fit I stick the tip of that gun in there, fill her up, you know, and we block that off. I don't know if you can see this or not, but we went ahead, cut our foam, just square up around this I-beam, <clears throat> and you've got two options there. You can either try and uh, custom fit a piece of this rigid insulation and stick it in there. You can glue the back side of it, stick it in there, or you can fill that up with this rigid foam. This is two-part foam. It is a, a vapor barrier, insulation barrier, all in one. Same as this rigid foam. It's not quite the same material, but very similar properties. So this is, you're not losing anything by filling these voids with the spray foam. So with that, uh, one more reason I wanted to talk to you <clears throat> on this particular crawl space. Like I said, our contractors came in here, installed some uninsulated ductwork in the crawl space. And when they did, this being a modular home, there's a vapor barrier up here, and we'll talk about, <clears throat> we talk about encapsulation of a crawl space. Your home needs to be encapsulated as well. So you'll have a thermal and pressure boundary around your entire home, meaning your, your typically your OSB and your insulation are in contact with each other on your exterior walls, your drywall and your insulation are in contact with each other in the ceilings. And then on the floors, typically if it's on a slab, that slab needs to be sub slab insulation with this rigid foam or in this particular home, you've got your um, <clears throat> OSB floor, and then your insulation is actually right above this vapor barrier. So when those contractors came in, they cut this vapor barrier open, pushed the insulation out of the way, installed their ductwork, and went on their merry way. Um, I'd really like to have a conversation with them and tell them how poor craftsmanship that is, but that's neither here nor there at this point. So again, Combining that with our ventilation right here, you can see any of that, any little bit of that heat that comes down into that ductwork or escapes that ductwork, actually the, actually the radiant heat off of that ductwork is just going to be absorbed down here and that's just a tremendous energy loss for this home. So by encapsulating this crawl space, we're gonna turn this into a conditioned space 
and that'll eliminate the need for us to go back in completely repair this vapor barrier re re return the insulation to the original value that it was installed at the factory so <clears throat> every crawl space is going to be different um, this particular crawl space I don't know if you can see or not, but we still have the ties here. These are our, our concrete form ties for when they installed this concrete. Um, we're going to have to go through and either break those off, bend them over. Uh, this particular crawl space, it would have probably been a little bit easier to come in with a two-part system. Uh, if you're going to do it yourself, there's what's called a froth pack, commonly referred to as a froth pack. Again, that's a brand name, but... Um, it's a two-part canister foam and we'll put a we'll put a picture on the video for you <clears throat> But you can literally come in here spray spray foam on this wall to a two inch level And it's going to be a lot easier than trying to fasten glue and fasten this rigid foam um, It worked out well for us. I have a friend with an insulation company. He really helped us out Matt at discountinsulation.net Thank you. He really did a, a great job for us getting some insulation we are in a time right now where insulation is really hard to get your hands on. We tried to get the froth pack, could not get the froth pack, so we decided to go with the rigid insulation for this video. So, Okay, so the one thing we didn't talk about is your sill plate up here. Since we're using rigid insulation, we can't really get to that to seal that off. That's where our can of car foam here comes in handy. We're just going to head and seal that off. That'll stop airflow from underneath that sill plate. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up the installation portion of the video. Um, as you can see, uh, what we did, number one, I'm never wrong, so this wasn't a mistake on my part. <laughs> what we did here is we just went ahead and showed you that, you know, when you get in your own crawl space, you're probably going to have to adapt and overcome. We had some tool malfunctions already down here, so uh, be prepared to uh, just face some adversity when you're down here. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about in the beginning of it is crawl space inspection. So it's not really a popular place to be. Most people don't want to go in their crawl spaces. But in, in all of my audits, I've found, you know, I'd say 15 to 20 percent, I will find a water leak. I will find some pretty substantial air leaks. Um, it's really, you should probably be in your crawl space once, maybe twice a year, just to make sure, especially if you have exposed water lines um, and you know you have open vents man it's a real easy place for it to freeze and bust so um, water leaks they do uh, especially on on well water they do add up to substantial energy costs um, I've seen well pumps running or cycling on and off or running non-stop will add anywhere from 30 to 90 dollars a month to an electric bill so always a good idea to make sure that you're inspecting your crawl space also once you get this completed and if you seal off your crawl space vents you definitely want to be down here once or twice a year to make sure you're not seeing any condensation any any excess moisture down here in the crawl space once you get it done so with that that concludes our video here again just to show you um, it is really easy a lot of people will say if you're going to leave a gap leave it a quarter inch so that you can get the tip of that caulk gun in there nice and nice and deep and get that foam all the way up against that wall other than that, uh, I think we showed you, you know, how to properly affix the moisture barrier to the concrete wall. So if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. Again, this is Brian Hoff, the Energy Advisor at Noble REMC.